So in this video, we'll talk about case one. Um, in particular, what we're trying to talk about here is how do we make defibrillation decisions when we're looking at someone who's experiencing hyperkalemia for whatever reason, and when that's impacting the ECG, and it can be quite challenging to read because we can see a number of different presentations on the ECG when we're looking at the hyperkalemic patient. So just a recap of case one, we're looking at someone who's in cardiac arrest. We're not 100% certain of the cause of arrest, but we do see that they've been lying on their limbs for an extended period of time as we roll them, we notice an arm and a leg is discolored. Um, it's swollen and we are starting to have a little bit of an index of suspicion that perhaps that's causing some rhabdomyolysis or the patient's having some or experiencing some crush related injury as a result of that. So they've compressed the blood supply to that area for a long time. The cells have been damaged. And the problem with that is our cell, uh, the major, major intracellular ion is potassium. So as we damage the cell, we start to see that potassium exit the cell into the blood supply. So those patients are at risk of hyperkalemia. So with case one, one of the problems with this patient is potentially the fact that they've lied on their arm and leg, they've destroyed those cells, allowed the potassium to escape those cells into the blood supply, and now the patient is also uh, experiencing a degree of hyperkalemia. And we have some fairly good evidence to support that. When we look at rhythm interpretations one and two, so we have rhythm interpretation number one here and number two here, what we find is that we have a slow wide rhythm. So in rhythm interpretation number one here, the rhythm is quite slow and we have a wide complex QRS. And in rhythm interpretation number two, we have actually a much more characteristic sine wave. Um, so likely as we start doing CPR, we, we are recirculating some of that potassium. We're potentially actually maybe even exacerbating some of that hyperkalemia as the potassium makes its way back to the patient's heart. So again, what's important here is that we're seeing, again, wide and slow complex uh, complexes. And in rhythm interpretation number two, this is really predictive of hyperkalemia because we have that sine wave pattern, which is that wide, slow rhythm uh, or the sine wave rhythm that we're seeing. So just as a recap, why are we getting that? So what I've drawn in on the side here is our normal action potential and normal myocardial action potential. Um, and this is what's giving us a QRS complex. And typically, as long as things look normal, then we will have a normal QRS complex and we have no widening. The problem that we have with hyperkalemia is that the resting membrane potential or the potential for the myocardium is going to go way up. So in hyperkalemia, we can draw it in, in green here. What happens is instead of having a resting membrane potential or myocardial resting membrane potential below threshold, we start to move close to threshold and then above threshold. And that's what's happening here. When you see a sine wave or when you see these wide complex rhythms, what that's telling you is that the resting membrane potential for the myocardium has gone well above threshold. So instead of being down here, it is way higher. So it's much above the threshold. And the problem with moving this resting membrane potential above the threshold is that it prolongs phase zero. And the reason for that is that we become more positive or this resting membrane potential becomes more positive. We get closure of sodium channels, the closure of sodium channels, and sodium channels are specifically what's allowing phase zero to do its job. So when we see basically threshold is met and we get this big spike in our myocardial action potential, all that this spike is indicative of is sodium rushing into the cells in order to cause depolarization. And when we hit this peak, that's the sodium stopping rushing in those cells. So the problem is when we become hyperkalemic, what's going to happen is we get closure of our sodium channels as our uh, resting memory potential goes up. And the problem with that is as we close sodium channels, it's just harder to have this big spike in our action potential. So what happens is phase zero gets really prolonged. So we start to see it getting really wide before we ever hit our peak. And we prolong this action potential and it looks way, way longer. Here, I've drawn it right off the screen. So it gets a lot longer. And the consequence of that is that our QRS complex is going to get wider. So if this is our normal, action potential, we have a nice narrow QRS complex. When we have a prolongation of phase zero, what you start to see is this really wide QRS complex. So basically, however long phase zero is gonna be is how long our QRS complex is going to look. And what we can see here is you see those big wide complexes here in rhythm number one, and you see that very clear sine wave rhythm here, which is highly indicative of the uh, basically prolongation of phase zero, the closure of the sodium channels that we see in hyperkalemia. 
So what you might be wondering is, well, then how do we get to rhythm number three in someone who has hyperkalemia? So it probably makes sense why we'd be in a wide complex bradycardia and we would consider treating that patient. But what we see in rhythm number three is it starts to get faster. And you have to remember that one of the things that we have done for this patient is we have given epinephrine. And epinephrine is going to act on the pacemaker cells in order to increase rate. And that's what happens here, is we're going to bind to our adrenergic receptors and we're going to make the pacemaker fire faster. So epinephrine is going to act in the pacemaker cells, so we see epinephrine acting here. And epinephrine is basically going to promote a faster rate. So it's going to act on the pacemaker to increase heart rate. And what can happen is that epinephrine is not going to improve the speed at which our sodium is flowing through uh, our sodium channels. So we know that when we have hyperkalemia, we have closed sodium channels, we have this prolongation of phase zero, but what it can promote is faster action here or basically faster stimulation of action potentials. And that is what we can see here. When we're looking at rhythm number three, this is still a rate under uh, 100. So the rate here, is 75 so we have a rate of 75 and we're seeing a wide complex so it's still wide complex it's still coming from the ventricles but the rate is 75 so it's not a ventricular tachycardia so this still could be considered the pathological or pathological rhythm associated with your hyperkalemia so the the rhythm is really wide we had pretty clear evidence to support hyperkalemia based on patient presentation as well as that sine wave rhythm on the ecg wide complex bradycardia so we've got both clinical evidence and cardiogram evidence that would support hyperkalemia and then following the epi, we start to see that speed up. So not uncommon that you might see that sine wave get faster in hyperkalemia when we're giving epinephrine, which is going to stimulate the pacemaker to go faster. So we get increased rate, but the speed of conduction through the myocardium uh, can't necessarily be increased substantially. So we still get that wide complex rhythm that we're seeing just at a much faster rate or at a faster rate because of the epinephrine. So the moral of the story here is that we should be looking at rate. We should be looking at the appearance of the rhythms and rate when we're making decisions around is this shockable or not shockable. Um, and again, the rate being less than 100 here is relevant because that makes it not a ventricular tachycardia and makes it not shockable.